This video is a response to questions from several friends regarding the interpretation of Peter Atiyah's Outlive. Here are our answers for your reference. Question 1. Why does the harmful substance lipoprotein B, LDL, exist in the human body? In the long process of evolution, this protein should have disappeared. Also, why don't animals experience atherosclerosis? Response. Animals can indeed experience atherosclerosis, especially domesticated pets and laboratory mice. They live well, have little physical activity, and still live long lives. Reports of atherosclerosis in wild animals are less common, mainly because their lifespans are shorter. Various animals, including cats, dogs, elephants, tigers, dolphins, and gorillas, live longer in captivity or in zoos than in the wild, some even for many more years. Atherosclerosis is a very long process, initiated in adolescence, but clinically evident only after the age of 60, without affecting daily life. Evolution operates through reproducing offspring, and natural selection only cares about the health of your body during youth to attract mates, and provide resources for offspring. Primitive humans completed the task of reproduction, and child-rearing before the age of 30, making atherosclerosis a non-issue. Evolution doesn't care about aging-related diseases. The problems posed by the four horsemen can only be addressed through human-made technology and lifestyle choices. Some genes, like the APO gene Z4 version, which predisposes individuals to Alzheimer's disease, were advantageous for young people in harsh conditions, but turned problematic in modern elderly life. Now, specifically, why does lipoprotein B, responsible for transporting cholesterol in low-density lipoproteins, LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, exist in the human body, if it's the culprit behind atherosclerosis? Firstly, all cells need cholesterol, and they can synthesize their own. However, relying solely on cell synthesis is insufficient. About 20% of cholesterol in the human body is stored in the liver, ready to supply various locations. This is where the transportation issue arises. Lipoprotein B, specifically LDL or the bad cholesterol, is responsible for transporting cholesterol from the liver to various cells in the body. In this sense, it's not entirely bad. It's more like a central government transferring funds to local governments. High-density lipoprotein, HDL, on the other hand, is responsible for transporting good cholesterol, essentially the excess cholesterol, back to the liver. It's a normal functioning process. So, why use low-density lipoproteins for transporting cholesterol from the liver? This is because LDL particles are larger and can carry more cholesterol at once. Once in different parts of the body, LDL particles can exchange cholesterol with HDL particles. Using a government finance analogy, it's like sending a large sum of money from the central government to local governments in one go, and gradually distributing it along the way. Sending money back from local governments to the central government is done bit by bit. Hence, calling LDL a design flaw is also a somewhat unfair characterization. This design might have been a necessary compromise. For young individuals, all of these processes are not problematic. Question 2. Is there a method to detect early signs of Alzheimer's disease? As people reach middle age, issues like memory decline and reduced efficiency bother many. Alzheimer's disease is irreversible in its later stages, so how can one scientifically determine if they are in the early stages of Alzheimer's? Response In the medical field, an intermediate stage before Alzheimer's disease is termed mild cognitive impairment, MCI. It involves more than just memory decline and reduced efficiency. It also includes language fluency, attention, association, logic, spatial memory, and abilities like naming as many animals as possible within a minute. A comprehensive assessment is needed, considering indicators such as changes in walking gait, facial expressions, visual tracking ability, and executive functions. Atia mentions an interesting indicator, which is the sense of smell. For example, the ability to correctly identify the smell of coffee, as the olfactory neurons are among the first affected by Alzheimer's disease. The good news is that not everyone with MCI progresses to Alzheimer's. The bad news is that Alzheimer's may already be on its way even before MCI occurs. A rational strategy, regardless of symptoms, is to focus on physical exercise, 
maintain a healthy diet and sleep, cultivate positive emotional habits, and learn new skills. Diagnosis is just a matter of internal certainty, as there are no particularly effective drugs available at the moment. Question 3. You mentioned that eating anything may not be very effective. Does that mean the trendy probiotics, which have gained popularity recently, are also not effective? Response. Probiotics do indeed have some health benefits, such as regulating the gut microbiota. We know that the gut is considered the second brain, with its complex neural network. The microbiota in the gut can even influence the brain, affecting emotions and behavior. A healthy gut microbiota has benefits for the digestive and immune systems, which are not easily improved through regular dietary means. There used to be an extreme method of transplanting feces from a person with a healthy gut into capsules, dried, and then consumed by others to improve their gut microbiota. While this may sound shocking, the fact that some are willing to try it indicates the significant impact of improving gut microbiota. Probiotics are a series of beneficial microorganisms for humans, but are not equivalent to the gut microbiota. Probiotics can come from yogurt and other fermented foods, and are generally sold as dietary supplements, not drugs. Taking probiotics may be a supplement and adjustment to the gut microbiota. It is generally believed that probiotics have some health benefits, but the question remains. How significant are these benefits? The National Institutes of Health, NIH, in the United States has compiled a series of probiotic-related studies. From these known results, the primary role of probiotics is related to the gut, with some therapeutic effects on diarrhea and constipation, although not very strong. No clear help has been found for inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. There is no evidence of specific assistance for diseases in other parts of the body, such as periodontal disease, allergic rhinitis, asthma, upper respiratory tract infections, etc. So, it can be clearly stated that the therapeutic effects of probiotics either do not exist or are very weak. Considering that the human body already contains various probiotics, consuming more may only serve to regulate rather than make decisive changes. I suspect that the current positive perception of probiotics may be related to the past positive perception of yogurt. Many believe that eating yogurt has health benefits, but research results are very clear. Yogurt has no health effects. As for some claims suggesting that probiotics can prevent or fight cancer, it's simply unfounded. Treating probiotics as if they were yogurt seems to be a good approximation. It's worth mentioning that the NIH website explicitly warns that probiotics may have side effects. For people with serious illnesses or compromised immune systems, probiotics may pose risks. There have been cases indicating that premature infants developed severe, potentially fatal infections after taking probiotics. Question 4. Can incorporating short naps throughout the day, as suggested in Life Hacking, be contradictory to the knowledge presented in this article? Response. Atiyah's book doesn't discuss the practice of using multiple short naps to replace a single long sleep. I understand that the primary purpose of short naps is to quickly restore energy. For instance, if you feel tired, sleepy, or lack concentration, a nap lasting no more than 25 minutes is the best pick-me-up. However, if a nap exceeds 25 minutes, it can leave you feeling groggy, having the opposite effect. But can multiple short naps completely replace a long sleep? The direct issue is that a complete sleep cycle takes 90 to 110 minutes, and the most beneficial sleep stages, deep sleep and rapid eye movement, REM, sleep, occur at the end of the cycle. This means that short naps may not include these two crucial sleep stages, which is obviously unfavorable. However, some studies have found that people who habitually take very short naps can experience REM sleep earlier. This could be a form of adaptation. Still, regarding deep sleep, I haven't heard of short naps being effective. Therefore, the best approach is to ensure an adequate long sleep and use short naps as supplements when feasible without causing insomnia. Question 5. With so many so-called mental disorders nowadays, are they all necessary? Have some issues, which can be minor or even negligible, been classified as diseases? Response. The topic of potential overdiagnosis of mental disorders is indeed intriguing. Take depression, for example. 
While we don't have specific data for China, materials I've come across suggest that before World War II, Japan had no mention of depression. It seemingly emerged after Japan deeply integrated American culture. Some even questioned if depression was an invented illness by Americans. That's not the case. Depression is a genuine illness, with substantial evidence. One explanation for its absence in pre-war Japan is attributed to the collectivist lifestyle in Asia. For instance, women working together in clothing factories during the day, chatting while working, reduces the chances of depression. More importantly, people in the past simply didn't prioritize mental health. It's not that people in old Japan didn't experience depression. It's just that the symptoms weren't recognized as an illness. This is similar to Alzheimer's disease, where people considered age-related confusion as a natural phenomenon. Even if someone unhappy eventually committed suicide, others didn't see it as a big deal. After all, there were much harsher things happening in the past. With improved modern living conditions, and a significant increase in life expectancy, our understanding of the baseline for a normal life has risen. What used to be considered normal now seems abnormal. Even today, many remote and underdeveloped areas experience numerous suicide cases, especially among women. There are individuals with mental health issues, and every village may have a few with intellectual disabilities, yet the locals see these as normal. If a young volunteer from a developed region were to visit such a village and say, this isn't normal. These are illnesses that need treatment. I believe the villagers should listen to them. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.